in e-commerce, everything is changing so rapidly that it's really hard to keep up. It's hard to keep up. Just when you think you've got it nailed, something changes, right? Hey, hey, welcome everyone week's episode of the Amazon Files are brought to you by Mommy Income. I am your host, Kristen Ostrander. And this week, we are going to talk about growing your business. I mean, doesn't everyone want to grow their business at some point or maybe maintain stable? That's fine. When we're growing a business, we want to reach a certain point, a certain point that gives us the freedom, the flexibility, the income that we want, the desired success that we're looking for, right? I mean, we started a business for a reason. And although the show is not about that, we could probably talk about that for more than two hours. But the reality is that we started a business for a reason and we are looking for success. We are looking for growth. We are looking for a specific maybe number or idea that we have in mind that we think will reach the goals that we want to reach. But in order to do that, there's certain things that we've got to do to grow, period. There's all different business strategies and different things for different businesses. But this specifically, um, this business growth strategies here that we're going to talk about are for 2022 for your Amazon e-commerce business and for all these different things. So yeah, you could read business growth strategies from all kinds of different business mentors and coaches and people like that. But this is Amazon specific. And the reason it's Amazon specific is because that's what we're all in this together. We've been trying to grow e-commerce businesses. We're trying to grow um, maybe brands and, and different things. So this is going to be your 2022 growth business strategies for your Amazon business, for your product-based business. We And these are all the different strategies because you could read about marketing strategies, but that doesn't really help us when we're doing Amazon, right? We need to talk about Amazon specific growth strategies. And so we're going to talk about that today. And I have like five or six different strategies that we're going to go through and talking about it. These are things that I'm doing regularly in my business to make sure that I'm on top of my game. Because in e-commerce, everything is changing so rapidly that it's really hard to keep up. It's hard to keep up. Just when you think you've got it nailed, something changes, right? Um, But guess what? There's nothing new under the sun. This is not new for business. If you're in business, you better be ready to make changes on a regular basis because that's what's going to be required of you. Um, And that's just plain and simple. So before we get to some of the strategies, I want to remind everyone that this is the very last week that you can sign up for the in-person workshop. Now, I know there's still a pandemic going on out there. I know that there's still things going on where, where, um, you know, safety and health protocols are very important. If that's something that that is hard for you to to walk through for whatever reason, um, we will have a virtual workshop coming up. So stay tuned and check the workshop page often. But this is the last opportunity to say, yes, you're coming. Maybe you're from driving distance and we are ready to get started this week week. So um, make sure if you have issues registering for America's Mart, um, we can help you out with that. I can bring several different guests in as my guest if you're unable to register on time. But this is something that has changed people's businesses at the very beginning of the year. You want to talk about growth? This is something that has catapulted so many people from stagnant, plateau, kind of looking for a change, not exactly sure what they want, all the way to wholesale bundle success. And I want that for you. So don't forget, it's a three-day type of thing. You can come to one or all, but it all includes the workshop materials, the meet and greet um, in the evening so we can kind of get to know each other, definite bundle building workshop and trade show walkthrough, mommyincome.com slash workshop. Also, workshop 50 will save you a few dollars if you want to come last minute. There's a couple seats left that we can accommodate. Um, We've almost reached capacity, um, which I'm thrilled about. And I'm so glad to meet all of y'all that are coming. And we'll see you in just a few days. So let's get to our business strategies. First of all, oh, yes, make sure you come to if you're not in our Facebook group, please join our Facebook group. It's a place you can come ask questions, get clarity on bundles and wholesale and all things Amazon. Um, Mommyincome.com slash join us. You need a code word. Your code word is growth. Actually, grow 
growth, I guess you could use that too. Um, and the reason we do code words is so that we don't have a whole bunch of people. Yes, our group doesn't have 25,000 people because we don't just let anybody in. We want to make sure that your e-commerce or Amazon base that you're exploring and or already have an Amazon business that you want to grow. And this is the place for you. It's not for everyone. So we don't ha allow it to be for everyone. You need a code word in order to get in. So um, mommyincome.com slash join us. Code word is grow and make sure that you type that in when they ask you the questions. Otherwise, we have to decline it. That's just the way it goes. Um, so make sure that you're following the rules. You get a code word and you come on in. Okay, so let's talk about our Amazon growth strategies because some of these are going to be, you know, we've probably heard some of them before, but how many of the, how many of these are you paying attention to and doing on a regular basis? Um, this is like our little gut check at the beginning of the year. We see last year's numbers. We may be happy with them. We may not be happy with them. And we want to change that one way or the other, whether we want to continue growing because we've done a great job or um, we want to um, start growing because we've just maintained whatever that means. That is something that we want to be able to pay attention to. So, you do, also this is another thing you don't have to be a billion dollar like a global brand in order to get the lion's share of the market for your products and for the competitors around you because unless you're a crazy good innovator and you're bringing something absolutely brand new to the table which we'll talk about one of the strategies um you're going to have some competitors here or there whether it's competitors on your bundle or similar brands and products put together the reality is you don't need to, to be a billion dollar brand. You don't even need to be recognizable by the general public. We are reaching people searching for products on Amazon. So what you need is just an unstoppable business growth strategy. And I'm going to give you like four or five or six today so that you can pick one or many of these to continue growing your business where you want it to be. That's really the ideal here is growing it to where you want it to be. Don't spend time chasing someone else's finish line or climbing someone else's ladder. You know, this is something that a lot of people have done or they see it out there and say, oh, I want to have a million dollar business. What if you don't? What if you don't even need? I want to make a couple thousand dollars a month to supplement my retirement or to supplement my income or to pay for some vacations or this and that. Do you all know that you do not have to reach seven figures to, in order to do that? You don't. You really don't. You can make a really decent profit without having a huge business. So you make sure that you need to do that. And number one, the number one growth strategy that I have right here, and I put it in number one for a reason. It's number one for a reason. So if you click off of this podcast or the dog starts barking and you have to run away, hear this number one first and then you can move on. Bro, you need to mind your business. Yeah, I said, mind your business. You know, like people said, none yo, none yo business. Yeah, mind your business. In order to grow, you need to know where you stand right now. And you also need to know where you want to go with that. And I'm not going to tell you all of those things of where you should go or this. That's up to you. But you do need to know where are you right now? Are you on the launch pad? Are you uh, halfway up the ladder that you want to be at and you want to move further up the ladder? Are you just getting started? Are you stepping sideways because you're still very unsure about what you're doing and where you want to go with it? You need to know where you are and where you want to go in order to grow. Numbers, especially and first and foremost, this is business. So if you don't have numbers around it, you might as well toss it in the trash. Cost of goods, operation costs, and other, what's your break even? If I walk up to any of you at any point, you better be ready to answer those questions off the top of your head, or at least in a spreadsheet that you can access. <laughs> I will let you, or some sort of form, or your QuickBooks, or your GoDaddy, or whatever it is that you're using for books or accounting. Now, this does not mean that you have to have every nook and cranny and every little tiny thing documented somewhere in a spreadsheet. Look, I use simple accounting still. Incoming, outgoing, profit. There's not really a whole lot left. What are you bringing in? What's going out? And what left? what's left over is profit. How profitable is your business right now? What's your profit margin? And what is your percentage that you're bringing in? 
you've got to know some of these numbers. You've got to know these numbers. What's your break even? In other words, what is it that you have to make every single month in order to just break even? All the bills are paid. All the the inventory and sourcing and all this kind of stuff is, is all set to go. And yet you didn't make a dollar, but you didn't lose a dollar. What's your break even? How many products do you have to sell or how much profit do you have to make in order to break even? What is your op cost? Um, just to keep the doors open and the lights on in your business, what is your operation cost? Do you know these things? So if you have a team or if you don't have a team, you should get a team <laughs> or you should get a, a VA or somebody that can help you when you get to that stage. Not everybody needs that right here and now. But eventually, uh, if you're looking for growth, you're going to need to know who does what when. And if that's all of you right now, write it down. Now, traditionally, people say, give me a business plan if you want to have some investors or you need money for different things. But the reality is, like, a lot of people don't sit down and write business plans for their Amazon business. And to be honest with you, I kind of have, like, this haphazard um, business plan. I like to make goals and different things, but I'm also not looking for capital investors or angel investors and anything like that. I'm not filing for grants, so I don't really necessarily need a formal business plan. But what I do have is, what is my plan of action? What are my key performance indicators, KPIs, for example, what is showing me whether or not I'm growing or sustaining and where what needs work. So who's doing what when? So and we have a team. And so who does what when? So exa for example, Prep Center receives, bundles, and ships all of our items to FBA. So that is their part of the process. My mom and I are the creative heads where we look at catalogs, we put, we do the research, we do the listings, we do the products, and uh, someone else does the images and the follow-up and ordering. And so who is doing what when in your business? This is just minding your business. This is the reason why I start with this one is because this is the one that people ignore the most. They don't want to do business operations. They just want to dig into catalogs and build listings or uh, build bundles and products and get excited about that. Well, me too. But the money is made in the numbers. The money is made at the end of the day when you actually sell that product and then see how much you're making on it. Because your initial investment or your initial cost of goods or your fees might have been one thing, but then when you actually make a sale and realize that the fees are a little bit more for whatever reason, or Amazon made a mistake, or you made a mistake somewhere, um, that's the real numbers. And those are the ones that you need to mind the most because our initial estimate um, may not have been correct. So you want to make sure that you're minding your business. Um, and who's doing what when and why are they doing it? And looking at things like what can you not be doing in order to grow your business, you're going to have to invest in someone, something, or, or both. Number one, your own education. In order to grow, you need to learn, you learn new things. Um, if you're at a stage where you're kind of hitting a plateau, maybe there's something new you need to add. And today's show is going to give you a lot of these suggestions of what you need to do to move forward and grow, specifically in this business. But another thing you might need to grow in with minding your business is your processes. Who's doing what when? Is it a well-oiled machine? Are you all over the place and unorganized and you sit at your desk and don't really know what you're supposed to do today because you don't have a boss telling you, sit down and do this. These are things we have to grow into. And as our business grows, we start to get more overwhelmed with all the different things that are going to come on our plate and we need to be a little bit more organized. So that's what I mean about minding your business. And listen, you guys, if any of you have questions about these things or you're saying, okay, yes, number one, I need to mind my business and I don't really know how, I got your back. This is what I do. I am a business strategist. I help people grow and succeed every single day in multiple industries. Believe it or not, I coach people and mentor people that are not even in the Amazon space because everybody needs to mind their business in some sort of way and everybody needs an outside look. Someone needs to look inside your business because you're so caught up in it that you may not even realize what's what the bottleneck is. And so that's really what I do. So if you need any of these things, whether it's going to be minding your business and your numbers and getting your duckies in a row or um, marketing or expansion or diversification, I've got your back. Mommyincome.com slash coach. Uh, I do coaching packages and uh, coaching on a regular basis to help you continue moving forward. So check that out if that's something that you're interested in having one-on-one -on -one mentorship. I don't have a lot of open spots. 
Um, so make sure that you pay attention to that. I love to see all of my clients' um, successes come to pass. So any of these growth strategies you feel like you need, uh, hit me up and I can help you with that. Okay, number two, marketing. It's not something we generally talk about in Amazon, specifically with our retail arbitrage or online arbitrage friends. There's not a lot of marketing, right? You're just scanning a product, you're making a little bit of margin on it, you send it in, that's great. Okay, but we I can also talk for another hour on how that's really not a business growth strategy. And if you're in retail arbitrage or online arbitrage or any sort of thrifting slash arbitrage within the Amazon space, that your growth is going to be naturally hindered by that business model in general. There's only so much you can do before it gets a hold of you and you aren't unable to grow beyond that point. So that's always something that we can strategize and talk about as well, because at some point, even with us in our business long ago, we had to transition out of retail arbitrage as profitable as it was because we couldn't grow beyond a certain point. And it was really manpower and the availability of products and widespread and, and different things and increasing uh, in companies, increasing what they do with their liquidations and their all the different stuff. Lots of different strategies. We can talk about retail arbitrage, but that's not a growth strategy. That's actually just um, maybe a good way to get started and get your feet wet. But I always encourage right away to get into real product sourcing, which is sourcing products from where you already buy them from. Like like if your Target sources products not from other Targets or other stores, they go to the source, the manufacturers and distributors. And that's, you know, talking about what we're doing. So marketing, this is the number, number two thing. This starts, marketing does not start with PPC campaigns. It does not. Please hear that. If you've launched a bundle in the past week or month and it hasn't had any sales, putting PPC, a pay per click for those that don't know, that's Amazon's advertising. Advertising your listing does not get you sales just because you pay to advertise it. It still has to be a good listing with optimized keywords, excellent photos, everything. It's not just about putting advertising dollars out there. Now, sure, if you want to blow your whole budget uh, on lose money on advertising, sure, you could up your bid and up your bid and pay more for ads and all this kind of stuff. But in reality, if you're not offering what a customer wants, then more visibility isn't going to help you. So it starts before your listing hits that. So here is what I will tell you to start with your marketing plan. If you want to grow and you want to start with marketing, take a look at your listings, your top five performers or your bottom five performers to where they're they're performing, but not the way that you want them to. When's the last time you updated that listing? When's the last time you checked the backend keywords, you checked a session percentage, aka your conversion rate, to see how many people are looking at it, how many people are seeing it, how many people are buying something else when they're buying, when they see your listing? When's the last time your images were updated? Are they the correct size? Are they zoomable? These are all listing troubleshooting things that you can do before you put PPC on your listing. I know most people become very impatient and they want things to sell immediately and right now and sell out as if it is the hottest trend out there. But let's be real. That's not always the case. Sometimes it takes time and energy and a little bit of love and a little bit of work in order to make the listing the best it can possibly be. So if your listing, I don't care if it's your top performer, if your listing is more than six months old, it's time to look at it. How do the images look? How are they placed? Are they in a specific order? Should you change the order? Do you have the correct keywords? Has the Have the trends changed and you need to update keywords? Is there more competition than there was six months ago when you wrote this listing? New images, new keywords, all these things can freshen up a listing and make it perform even better. Also, your bullet points. New strategies for your bullet points could be the, the top three bullet points are the most important features. So think about your features of your product. What is it that you want to highlight? What do you need the customer to know in order to make a decision? What would you need to know about this product or these this bundled product that you would need to say yes to as a customer? So take off your seller, you know, 
glasses and put on your customer glasses and look at this from a customer perspective. If you can get like a 10 year old or 11 year old to read your listing and know exactly what it is, you're on the right track. That's kind of the thing is that we don't have to get fancy. We just have to say, okay, what is this? What does it do? What problem does it solve or need does it meet? And then you can use of bullet points in your listing to to describe or answer like common questions or like overcome objections. So why would be people be hesitant to buy this item? Maybe they don't really know the brand. Maybe they're scared it's not good quality, um, these types of things, or they're just unheard of, so they're, they're hesitant. What would make you hesitate to buy something brand new? And what would give you the confidence to say, okay, this says this, this says this. Now, some of this is already built into Amazon because we all know, cue the eye roll here, um, that Amazon will pretty much take back any product, anytime, anywhere, if a customer is not satisfied. So that's kind of built in by your confidence, but then still people have brands to choose from. They have products to choose from. They can choose your bundle or your product, or they can scroll down and pick somebody else's. So tell them why yours is the best or yours is the one they should buy. Let them know you're saving them time, money, energy, and packaging by buying from your listing. I mean, these are things that you can talk to the customer about. Um, and of course, those images, high quality, high resolution images are what is going to sell your product. The title Optimized title will bring someone in via search. And once they get to your search, then they're going to be using the images to kind of decide if your listing's even worth looking at. So making sure that your image is crystal clear, that they know what they're getting, that you're following the rules, that you have high quality, high resolution images on your stuff. And if you haven't updated some of your images in a while, Maybe it's time to just revamp those. Mommyincome.com slash Canva. Everything can be done in Canva nowadays. You can make it a specific size. You can add and subtract. It's just like Canva is my absolute favorite. I use Canva Pro and... Canva Pro is just the most fantastic thing for us non-designer. Most people don't know Photoshop or don't have Photoshop and don't have the skills to, to and want to learn all that kind of stuff. I don't. So I use Canva because it makes it really easy for non-techie kind of people like myself. So that's your sort of marketing. Do not use PPC until you know your listing is optimized and indexing. So indexing is putting your keywords in there and you're being able to find it in search. So um, even if it's page 10, you're still indexing for that keyword if it's coming up under that. And you can test that by using either your ASIN and a specific word or the typing your specific title in or your specific keyword phrases you're trying to index for and making sure that those are showing up in search. So if you can find your listing in search. Now, sometimes this is better to do in like an incognito window or um, a private browsing or maybe from someone else's phone or computer or something like that because Amazon already knows that you've been searching for and listing your own product. And oftentimes, if you're logged into Seller Central, it's not going to show you your own product because they know you already know that's there. So using it from a private browser or for somebody else's phone or computer to check your listing or have a friend do it, you can do it in the hub if you're in the hub and say, hey, can somebody you know, look at this. Also, if you have Helium 10, um, Helium 10, there's an index checker. So it will run through your index checker and see like what you're optimized for and what you're indexing for. And then there's certain ways to be able to fix that as well. Um, in the hub, there's an entire listing troubleshooting um, training that you can get. Um, it's part of your hub membership. And you want to make sure you watch that as well, because I give you step-by-step -step ways to make sure your listing is optimized, making sure that you're indexing and things to do to fix it in case you're finding that somehow you're you're not optimized or you're not uh, indexing for specific keywords. So make sure you view that training if you um, if you need help in that area. Finally, with your marketing, a B testing. So testing, if you if you have brand registry, but you don't have A plus content, mess around with A plus content. Um, add some things to your A plus content. There's usually certain images you can add. You can add text. You can add all kinds of different stuff. And even if you sell very unsexy things, sometimes people just like to know a little bit more about um a little bit more about what you're selling and or or even your brand story. So you, you say, I don't have a brand story. I just created this bundle brand because I want to do this on Amazon and, you know, get rid of my competitors. So what? That's still a story. I'm finding a way to make it 
more convenient and easy for people to find and buy the things that they need because we're all busy and don't have a lot of time to be shopping. So when we're looking for something, my bundle or whatever your bundle brand is makes it easy for you to buy the things you normally buy anyway with one click, save on packaging. I mean, highlight what you feel like your customer really, really needs. Okay, and then finally is, a like I said, A-B testing. This is just like testing different titles, different um, different images and image orders or things like that. And the way you can do A-B testing would be like you have to track something. So say you just changed the order of your images to see if that made any difference or um, maybe you updated your title. Look, you can only do one KPI at a time, one A-B test on one thing for one period of time. So if you're going to A-B test, you've already tested it before. So you, whatever you have up there now, you keep track of that. So what are your total sessions? What is your total number of sales and your conversion rate, aka your unit session percentage, that is the conversion rate. How many people buy once they land on your listing? That's what that translates to. So session, unit session percentage is that number. So when I say what's your conversion rate on your thing, that's the number that you need. So if you're converting at a 3% right now, then you need to change, maybe you're change your title. Then you need to record these numbers, like your, your total number of sales, your unit session percentage, maybe your revenue or whatever that is from that listing, and then change the title. And then a week later, record those numbers. Is there a difference? Was there a difference? Did it increase your sales? Did it stay the same? What Then that shows you, was the old title or the new title better? So this is for listings that have already have some sales, and maybe you're just trying to boost them a little bit. Little goes a long way. So that's ways you can test things on images. You can test that on bullet points, your your title, the order of your images, because I know your mainstay has to be your mainstay. But then you can also change the order of what people see first, second, third, and whatnot. So that's a way to test your listing to see what's performing the best. And these are the things that get caught in the weeds that people don't look at and they think that they just have to grow um, and have to get more money to buy more product to offer more product. When the reality is we don't always have to do it that way. A growth strategy can be what's already working and how can we enhance what's already working. That's called working smarter and not harder. Do and improve upon what's already working. So if you've got listings that are already working, how can you make them even better to reach even more people and even then add some PPC? You don't know. But these are marketing strategies that you can use on Amazon. There's also off Amazon marketing strategies that you could use. I know that there's a lot of um, people out there that encourage like Facebook ads or different um, social media ads in order to lead people to your products. I only suggest that if you have expertise in that area. Facebook ads are no joke and it's a really fast way to get your Facebook account ad account shut down forever. They're not going to close your Facebook account, but they will say you're no longer allowed to pay for ads or have ads or do all that kind of stuff if you screw up. So, um and honestly, you would you know you need to know a little bit about marketing in order to you don't just hit that and just send out your ad to any and all people like your your products have certain demographics certain people certain avatar that's going to buy that and you have to know how to do that so i don't suggest that unless you really know what you're doing and you have some time to dedicate to doing outside ads um, the another way to just continue the marketing process is to add you know add things to your current listings like naming your images and re-uploading them because in case you didn't know, Google picks up the metadata and the tags and the names of your images and then categorizes them. So say someone is looking for a tulip vase and you have tulip vase as your named image in your Amazon listing, it's going to come up in a Google search. So name your images. That's just another way you can go through and upgrade your listing to make it better. Okay, number three is diversification. In order to grow, you need to start diversifying. And this means multiple diversification. It's not just about 
expanding into other marketplaces, which is actually strategy number four, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But right now we're talking about diversifying. In other words, if you are doing retail arbitrage, you need to add some other business models. In order to grow, you've got to do something different than you're doing now. You can add to it, but you can't take away from it. So first, retail arbitrage and online arbitrage, I cannot say this enough. If you're doing that now, even if you love it, you guys, I loved retail arbitrage. Some people like hate it and they don't ever want to do that and all that kind of stuff. I loved it, but I didn't love that it was hindering me from growing beyond a certain point. I also didn't love that as I continued growing, I had to continue putting more and more hours in to where when you're growing your business, it should be the opposite. At some point, you should get so streamlined that you're doing far less and making far more. That's really the goal. And that's where I'm at now, but that was not possible when I was doing retail arbitrage. It wasn't possible because the more I grew and the more product I sold, the more product I had to go out and find and search for and make sure I could stock my shelves to where now I have hundreds of thousands of products at my fingertips that I can open catalogs, whether digitally or physically, and look for new products to bundle together to sell. The possibilities are limitless and I don't have to leave my house and go all over God's green earth to try to find product to sell. That costs a lot of time in the end. It was too much. And I ended up working 60 hours a week, 70 hours a week because I loved it and I like to go out shopping and do that sort of thing. But it was also a major bottleneck for growth. There's no way I could have reached the levels that I've been reaching with continuing with retail arbitrage. So one of the things is, is diversification. You've got to have your hands in multiple cookie jars in order to make this work. So if you're doing arbitrage still, whatever that is, venturing into wholesale. So keeping arbitrage for a time and venturing into wholesale, maybe getting one or two accounts and a couple new products set up. If you're already doing wholesale and you're doing some other combination, adding a few bundles, not all at once, not all or nothing, not black and white, but just start to add small things. If you're into bundles already and you're you're doing okay, but you still want some growth, transitioning into new product lines, new niches, new categories, going completely outside the box. I'm not kidding you. I had one lady transition from very, very small and light items, which were doing well, but also very minimum profit. She, she was working more on volume than she was on, on profit margin to where I'm up just for you guys, for your information. I am a margin based business. I do not push a ton of volume for minimum profit. I pra I practice maximum profit per bundle so that I don't have to sell as many units, which means less maintenance, less ordering, less products coming in and out when you're, you're looking at margin. So I'd rather make 10, 10 to $20 or more per bundle than I would making, you know, two or three dollars on something that I have to sell 5,000 of to make the same money. Do you see what I'm saying? So the same amount of work for way more money. And so this lady was transitioning. She transitions from something so small to something so huge. It just made me laugh. Um, and it was into furniture. So she went from going to selling small and light things to selling um, things like side tables and, and, and different like furniture because she realized there was a huge margin in that. Number one, people are paying big money for these things. And number two, they're able on Amazon to see the item in their space. You can take pictures of it. Amazon gives them, an, I mean, this is the AI on the stuff is so amazing that, you know, you can sell furniture now and uh, make really good profit margin on it. So, you know, just the things like that, diversifying into new categories, new product lines, new vendors, which is why going to a trade show or doing trade show stocking is really helpful. Um, even if you haven't been out to stores in a while, walking around, uh, some different stores that you might be interested in carrying their products, taking some pictures of the manufacturers and then coming home and doing some research. Expanding into new product lines. Get uncomfortable because that's where growth happens. It happens when we're uncomfortable. When we're chilling and we're comfortable and whatever, uh, we're living a life of ease, usually there's not a whole lot of growth that's happening. 
growth has to break through. Just like a seed that's planted into the soil and watered and it needs sun and water and um, soil and all those things in order, eventually it has to break its shell in order to grow. That's what growth does. And so it's not comfortable, but it's inevitable. You need it in order to grow. So get uncomfortable. Okay. So, so if you're, you don't have to go opposites and go crazy, but like, say if you're selling a lot of grocery items, maybe venture into some home goods or some, um, products that are just a little bit different and do some research. I mean, you might discover something new that you, um, were never knew that you had in you. You, you just don't know until you're kind of poked and you're forced to get out of that comfort zone. Um, vendors, new vendors, new marketplaces. So when I, I say that hesitantly, but not hesitantly, because it goes right into number four, which is expansion. And so diversification and expansion are similar, but they're not the same. So when I say diversify, that also means taking whatever you're selling now and venturing into new marketplaces. Have you ever put any of your listings, bundle listings or anything like that on like Facebook Marketplace or Etsy or um, maybe considering a brick and mortar store uh, that might want your product? Because believe it or not, regular brick and mortar retail is still surpassing e-commerce. Although Amazon is the highest and most grossing e-commerce website on the planet, it's still only a percentage of the market share of regular retail, whether it's e-tail or retail or e-commerce, whatever else, it's still all in the pool of retail. And brick and mortar stores are still dominant to this day. It's still, it's not, Amazon has not taken over the world yet, <laughs> as much as we'd like to think they have, um, and they're trying to. Um, there are still many, 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 many places people go all the time to get specific products. They don't always go to Amazon for everything. And so when I'm saying expansion and diversification, that's what I mean. Diversify into brick and mortar stores or website or your own website. You know, if it's time to open up your own website and um, market some of your products there, that's an that's a possibility. It's scary. It's unknown to a lot of us, but at the same time, it's diversification. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always gotten. And if you're trying to grow, you're going to have to do things differently. You're going to have to try new things and take some risks. It's just part of being in business. So let's go to expansion because expansion is attempting to sell your existing products into untapped marketplaces. And when I say untapped marketplaces, yes, there's obvious ones. If you're selling on Amazon and only on Amazon, you can expand into Walmart. And if you're in the hub, there's a brand new Walmart training in there of kind of how to get started with this, the do's and don'ts. You've got to see this video. Um, and it's Shopify. You can start selling on Shopify. You can open up a brand store for your Shopify that, that could be a possibility for other people to do business with you. Um, Etsy, eBay, a Facebook Marketplace, brick and mortar stores, or business to business. Have you ever considered selling your products as a wholesale product to other companies, other businesses? Um, there's one lady that actually is out of Amazon now, but she used to be in Amazon. She created this amazing bundle and this kit and even a book that went around to it. And she was considering taking it to Boys and Girl Scout clubs because it was something that was really up their alley. And it was something that maybe people aren't searching for on Amazon, but it has a market in the educational space. So does, does your product have a market? I know that Catherine, which is one of our case studies, if you haven't seen this, it's coming soon, um, who has done these, these different boxes that she's creating, the Beat the Boredom boxes, were for senior citizens who oftentimes get bored and lonely and, um, you know, taking her box not only to Etsy, but also to local stores and even local senior centers where some people would, you know, buy the gift and give it to somebody or they could use it as group activities, you know, things like that. So don't pigeonhole or box yourself into just Amazon. If you've got great products that are selling well, it's time to expand them. Who else needs this product? Who else wants this product? It's not just a bundle of products you're putting on Amazon in order to keep off hijackers. Y'all got to think bigger, bigger than that. What you're doing isn't a waste. It's not just another way to make a couple dollars so that you can just, you know, survive. Think bigger, dream bigger. What is the possibility for this product? Is Amazon the end all be all for everything you're doing? Gosh, I sure hope not because that's very limiting. 
And it's okay because some of you guys are just starting. But if you're in a phase where you've just kind of like you're looking for a little bit more growth and you're you're doing pretty well with this stuff and you're kind of looking for some of those advanced strategies, here they are. There's there's enough here for beginners. Now, don't let this overwhelm you if you are a beginner and you're just starting out. You'll get there. Sometimes your strategy is just to do the work, get the bundle listed, take the pictures, do the research, go to a workshop, go watch the training again, whatever it is that you need to do. That's part of your growth strategy. But for others, it's time to expand. It's time to get uncomfortable so that you can get what you really want because nothing is going to just land in your lap. You're going to have to go seek it out. All right. Now, this is kind of a, this next strategy is not for the faint of heart, but I know that there's people like you and like me that like to be disruptive in a way. And so this is more like your, your disruption and it involves coming to like a well-established industry with something new and different than everyone else, yet it still ser serves the customer. It's just new and different. And one of the products that I, uh, one of my private label products, which is actually a wholesale bundle um, in its highest form, it is a private label slash wholesale product put together, but it disrupted the market because it met a need that wasn't yet met by all the other products in the marketplace. And that's a lot of times what bundles are doing. You're not just taking a couple of products that are pretty complementary and putting them together. You are disrupting the normal, average, everyday, how people buy products, and you're making it easier, better, convenient, more environmentally friendly. Naturally, you're doing that because you're reducing the amount of packages and shipping costs and you know all the things that involved in that. So you can always use that as a highlight in one of your bundles. You are environmentally friendly because instead of somebody buying three or four things in three or four different packages, and then if it delivered three or four times different separately, you're you're reducing the environmental footprint. Uh, I don't even say that right either, but you know what you guys know what I mean. By by reducing the packaging, reducing emissions from gas because they only have to deliver one package instead of four. I mean, there's so many different things and benefits to bundles, but bundles are a disruptor. So you don't have to be like, you know, one of the examples is um. Um, like Dollar Shave Club was one that disrupted the entire shaving industry, right? Because they went direct to customer and said, hey, come to our website, buy Dollar Shave Club. Who needs to spend $50 on razors every month? You know, you got to shave and you got to do this and that. They were genius. And eventually they sold their business for $1 billion because they were brave enough to say, hey, we can make a better quality product or the same quality product and save people a ton of money if they will just come directly to us. So forget Gillette, forget all these other places and other people um, and what they make or whatever else. Now, I don't know a whole lot about Dollar Shave Club. I just know that they, that's how they did business. Instead of going to the regular outlets and selling their products to these places, they said, we can do better. We can mail this stuff to you on a subscription level for way cheaper than you would in the store. And we can serve the same quality. And they bypassed all other channels and did it differently and hence made a billion dollars. So no risk, no reward, right? But that's what disrupting means is it's saying, hey, this is antiquated and we're going to upgrade it to 2022 and we're going to make this process or this product even better. And if you can make it cost a little bit less or the same, but make it more convenient or easier for people to do, You've got a winning combination. And guess what? Bundles disrupt. And why do they disrupt? Because they're bringing something new and relevant while saving people money, saving them time, saving the, the environment, all these different things. So in order to do that, you've got to be able to have a clear grasp of what your products are, what your bundle is, and why it's different and better than anyone else's. Well, even if, even your answer is, well, it just saves you time and money because you can, you know, you can order it all in one, you know, right click and swipe to add to cart or buy now or whatever it is. You guys, that's enough. 
it really is enough to say this is better because it saves somebody time, energy, money, packaging, and is good for the environment because it doesn't have as much cardboard or plastic. The end. It's better. That's why it's better. Or, you know, sometimes, you know, what knowing your customer's pain points, knowing why they need your product, even it doesn't have to be your product. That's the at label sellers. We, I can explain to you why you need this coffee mug in this particular gift box um, until the cows come home. You just explain it. You know, you can say this is better because it comes in a gift box. It's not going to get broken. It's going to arrive to somebody you're giving a gift to that's awesome and it's not going to be broken and they're going to have this experience that they think that they're getting like uh, the most expensive mug, except they're getting the same mug that you could probably go buy at Target, except for they're getting it in this beautiful black box with a wonderful brand stamped on it and they're getting an experience that you probably paid $2 for because your packaging was $2 but you bought the same mug that you could buy on Alibaba or people from Target could probably source someplace. You see, you're creating something different that disrupts what people are used to and therefore they're intrigued and interested. So disrupt by using bundle strategies that are different than anything else. Because yeah, sure, you could buy this hair care product that's this, this, and this, or you could buy this hair care product that's in a bundle that also comes with this other thing that is the most amazing thing for hair. Who knows? This is why we do the research, figure out what products go well together. But then it's all about the presentation and how you are presenting it to your customers in a way that disrupts their normal thinking of, I'm just going to go down to Walgreens and buy my hair gel. Why do I need to buy it from Amazon? Well, because it comes like this and it comes with this product that you need all the time. You know, whatever it is that you're creating, that's disrupting. And that's something that you need to know your customers' pain points or their desires and satisfy their needs. And all you have to do is do it slightly better than your competition. And bundles already do that because it's already a built-in value add that you're putting it all in the same package. And finally is strategic partnerships. So this is one that's kind of an outlier because a lot of people are going to be like, no, I'm not going to do any of that. That sounds very uncomfortable, especially if you're kind of an introverted person and you don't love having conversations and talking with people. But a simple email could change your life. To be honest, strategic partnerships are so important to business growth. You have no idea. Let's like, for example, I have a strategic partnership with Merchant Words. Number one about the partnership is I love Merchant Words and I've loved them since I started using them. And it's not necessarily because they're the best in the marketplace or that they're the best people, which they are. And I love them to death and they're amazing people. And I love that. But the reality is I use them and their services because they work because it's crystal clear to understand, the tools are easy to use, they're constantly upgrading and innovating and making things easier and better for me to write listings and all those things, and they've done nothing but serve and serve and serve for years. So I trust them and work with them. That's a strategic partnership because they also deal with a lot of Amazon sellers who need bundling because their business is failing or they're really struggling to um, find strategies that are working for their own growth. And so they lead people over to Mommy Income and say, hey, this is a great strategy we've heard of. So these strategic partnerships help both of us build our business up and grow it. And yes, that's from a different space. But here's a strategic partnership that helped both complementary industries grow. The, the partnership is Taco Bell and Doritos, okay? So years ago, I don't even know when it was. It, probably, it was Maybe it's been five years or more now. But when Taco Bell introduced the Doritos Locos Taco, they sold $1 billion of Taco Doritos Locos Tacos within the first 18 months. I love stats. I love numbers. Their proof is in the pudding, they say, right? The proof is in the data. 18 months, a billion dollars in sales because Taco Bell and Doritos partnered up. I mean, mind blown, right? Has anybody here had a Doritos Locos Tacos or at least tried one because you felt like you had to have a taco that also had a Dorito as a shell? Um, yes, I have tried Doritos Locos Tacos and I like them. Um, because I do like Doritos and I do love, love, love tacos. So because of that, that was just a partnership made in heaven, right? They're both kind of, you know, in the same vein, although Doritos aren't really Mexican food or whatever else. And I'm not sure I would even 
called Taco Bell Mexican food. It's like a cheap knockoff of like real stuff. But that's just my opinion. But that to say, looking at strategic partnerships. Now, some of you guys are gonna be like, I don't know who to partner with. I don't, I don't know, you know, I'm not in software or this, that, and the other thing. So all you have to do to partner to, with anyone, whether it's a business or another human being, um, maybe someone from the hub, maybe someone from the Facebook group, maybe from somebody from another Facebook group you know of, partnerships can help if it's a win-win situation for both people. It simply could be meeting one hour a month and just trading bundle ideas or running bundle ideas by someone and getting an extra perspective. It could be going to a vendor and saying, may I be the exclusive on this product and this is how I'm going to help you grow and therefore you're going to help me grow and it's going to be a great partnership. So these, there's all kinds of different partnerships that you can make. You can barter with somebody to say, okay, you have design skills, but I have really good research skills. You help me design these images or A-plus content, and I'll help you do your research on keywords or optimize your... I mean, barter. If you have more time than you have money, then use that to your advantage. And with, with the idea of serving and helping, it's not just what can I get, it's what can I give. What can I give? What can we trade? So whether it's reducing costs or sharing ideas or co-working. So maybe somebody's really good at one thing and you're really good at another. And if you co-work, then you get double duty done because you're doing theirs, they're doing yours. Things like that, you never know. Can you partner with another Amazon seller? Have you seen a private label product that is selling by itself on Amazon that you would love to put in your bundle, but you know it's a private label seller? Have you reached out? Did you do a little Google recon and find out that the person that owns this brand um, can be reached and you reach out to them and say, hey, I love your brand. I love this idea. May I use this in one of my bundle boxes and I can pay you wholesale and I can, you know, you'd be surprised at what other business owners are, are willing to do to make money. In profit, because that's what we do in business, right? We're trying to profit. We're trying to make money. And so what can, and the rising tide raises all ships. So if we're all floating on the same ocean and the tide goes up over here, it goes up over there. That's what that means is that we can all help each other rise and grow if we're willing to have a give mentality. So those are your strategies for business growth. Um, use one or all of them, but here's what you don't do. You don't do them all, all at once and try to get yourself all overwhelmed and say, oh, Kristen says we have to do this, this, and this. There's an order of things. Um, these were in a specific order, but yes, number one was number one. Mind your business. Yeah, I said that. Mind your business. In other words, make sure you know these numbers. Y'all, I don't play. So anytime, you better be ready for me to ask you these questions. You better be ready for me to be like, oh, Kristen, it's so nice to meet you. Yeah, I'd be like, what's your, what's your um, profit margin? No, I'm not really going to ask you that, but y'all should be ready to answer those questions at any time. What's your private margin? What were your sales in 2021? What do you want your sales to be in 2022? How are you going to get there? Be ready to answer those questions for yourself. Not that anybody's going to give you answers. And no, I'm not going to be asking you that. Although I could, you never know. Do it all at once. Start small. Step really small. What is one thing on this list that you can implement right now? Because there's got to be something. Maybe it's just watching the Walmart training and filling out the application for Walmart the proper way, which is taught in the video. So don't skip over that. <laughs> what if it's a partnership that you thought about? You thought, oh my gosh, I'm really good at graphic design and maybe I could trade somebody designing their A-plus content for them to do some research for me because I'm not very good at that and I feel like I stumble or putting a mock listing together or whatever reach out. There is no harm in getting a no. Did you know that? Did, do you guys know that? For a, this, is, this has to do with vendors. This has to do with accountability. This has to do with Facebook. This has to do with any old thing. Rejection will never kill you. It won't. No, that's okay. I promise you won't die. You know how many no's I get on a regular basis? It's just, to me, it's just not yet. 
I never take no for an answer. Not usually. Um, I usually like, oh, they mean not right now. They don't mean no forever. They mean not right now. Or they maybe didn't hear me right and I need to explain it another way. Or maybe the win-win is not what I thought and I need to create a bigger win for them. Um, no is never no. No is always still a possibility. Um, but, you know, a lot of times we don't do things because we're scared of rejection. We're scared of failure. We're scared that what if it doesn't work out? But what if it does? you? What kind of partnership could you create that could be really awesome if it's a yes? And if it's a no, it might not be right way. And that's probably a good thing. So really do these things really small, one thing at a time, plan your growth strategy. And finally, document these things. Document what you're going to do. Write it. I don't care if it's writing it down on a sticky note or in the notes on your phone or a Google Doc or wherever. I don't care. Write it down. Document the results. Data is king when it comes to growth. You need to know where you're at, where you want to go, and what's happening in the middle. And if you change your listing, document what happens. If you don't document it, it was all for nothing. And a sale is not necessarily the win or lose of changing your listing. Sometimes the number of people that come to your listing, your session percentage, your conversion rates, page views, maybe those are helping to where it's increasing your page views, but not your conversion rate. And then you can change another KPI next. Paying attention, minding your business, diversifying, expanding, creating partnerships. This is how we grow business. So tell me. How are you going to grow your business this year? Which one of these strategies resonates with you the most? The one that says, yes, that is what I need to do. Yes, that's hard. Yes, that's scary. But yes, that's what I need. I would love to hear your thoughts. You can always reach out to me um, in the Facebook group. You can tag me. You can leave a comment below this video. You can always leave a review on the podcast. I'd love to, to have your review as well on there. But reach out. Let people know. Just put it out into the universe. Say, hey, I'm going to work on this growth strategy. And I'm super excited. You know, you, you need that sometimes. I'm here for you. I know y'all could be anywhere else listening to any other thing right now. I don't take that for granted. Thank you for allowing me to serve you for yet another year on the Amazon Files podcast. And we'll see you same time, same place next week.